Hello and welcome to the Adoption and Fostering Podcast. Today is a conference in Scotland, in Edinburgh. Um, it's been hosted by Adoption UK and the Scottish Government, um, with support from the Scottish Government, I should say. I've got um, a co-host today. It's not Al. Um, it's a female co-host. Um, and I'm just going to get them to introduce themselves so you know who they are. Hi, I'm Ali and I'm an adoptive parent of three. Hi, I'm Alison Woodhead and I'm the Head of Comms, Director of Comms for Adoption UK. Thank you ladies and there will be a delay because we're passing a microphone round so you'll have to forgive us for that but um, hopefully you'll be able to hear us all right and as Al, Al isn't here he's going to have to edit it anyway so I'm sure he'll um, be frustrated and spend an hour doing it um, and it's actually the room is packed um, the guys up here have done a really good job of doing it um, so we're going to speak to a few people um, and the first one obviously is Ali um, so um, you're an adoptive parent at three, and um, what is your kind of um, interest in FASD? Hey, thank you, Scott. Um, so my interest in FASD is that our youngest um, has FASD, um, though we do not have a formal diagnosis for that, but I can maybe talk about that in a bit as to why. Um, <laughs> and um, the two older ones are possibly affected by um would say more likely the middle than the oldest of them. Um, so that is my interest, yes. So you, you've, you've preempted my next question then. So um, not an official diagnosis as yet. You live in Scotland, obviously, and it's slightly different to England in terms of some things, but I'm guessing that getting a diagnosis for FASD in Scotland is just as hard as it is in England. Um, where did you start trying to kind of, I mean, what made you think it was FASD and then what, you know, what sort of journey did you take to get medical support, I guess? Okay, so um, our wee guy came to us and we already knew that that was a strong possibility due to um, pre-natal history, pre-birth history. Um, and as time has gone on, that's become more and more obvious, um, particularly in his impulse controls or not... A, inability to control his impulses so have lots of very interesting activities happening in our house as a result of that indoor waterfalls and all sorts um, <laughs> so uh, that's really spurred us on um, and we went actually to uh, a talk about four years ago now and we kind of sat in the room and it, it was a total light bulb moment for us and um, we kind of gone with him in our minds but then sat there and were like actually we've probably got three of these in our house um so yeah as a result of that that's really spurred us to you know try and get a diagnosis and the reason for that is actually to get the help um ultimately it's you know it's not about getting labels or anything um so he does have a diagnosis which is a neurological um diagnosis which recognizes the impact of alcohol and drugs um pre-birth um, it's just it's not quite the right label. So um, and, and it was interesting as well because we've just um, listened to Dr. Raj Mukherjee. I can never pronounce his surname. I'm so bad. Um, and he was saying that one in three looked after or adopted children is likely to have FASD. And we should be make well my words my take on it was we should be making the assumption to try and rule it out rather than you know this kind of fight so how frustrating is it to you know why you want the, the the diagnosis but how frustrating is it to to not be able to get that yeah it's really frustrating um because it, it's it affects like day-to-day -day life you know and as they're getting older you see that the span between them and their peers gets wider and wider which often for our kids anyway you know with attachment and trauma related issues and um, that's true but for them they're cognitively not functioning um, or they're certainly not functioning at their genetic age their chronological age um, so it is frustrating because you just think uh, you know right now um, we're not in mainstream school and I'm not sure how that's going to pan out in the future but certainly if we were able to have a diagnosis then that would open some doors potentially um, as time goes on and you know we, he gets older um, I think that's 
you know, that's going to have a big impact potentially. Okay. Um, so just just given your experience, what uh, what advice would you give other parents? Because I am adoptive mum to an 11 year old who doesn't have a diagnosis and actually to be honest until recently it hadn't occurred to me that this might be one of the things that was going on for her um, but there are lots of things that are ringing bells the more I learn about FASD so what should I do where do I go with that okay so some great organizations out there that can obviously give you support and information um, Adoption UK itself, obviously, um, but also there's the FASD Alliance, which has a massive network of lots of smaller, um, sort of slightly independent organisations or individuals that have set things up. So I would go, I'd check their website, find out if there's something in your local area. Through that, you can get contact with other families, parents um, and professionals who are working in the area who are... Um, sympathetic and understanding of the needs of adoptive families and their children. Um, I recommend a few books. So it's um, a book by Maria Catrick, um, which uh, is we we kind of use that really when we were going to our GP um, and went through it and just looked at like all of the different symptoms, if you want to call it that, um, characteristics, and were like able to say, okay, well, so we can tick this or this is an example and uh, that's the thing that I found as well people want concrete examples they don't want you just to say oh yeah he does that um, like actually you know keep a little notebook and start writing things down um, physically children do change obviously as they get older so if you have got any photographs which I know can be difficult um, from like earlier on in life then that can be helpful as well and go back and read your CPR um, you know and go back and then question um, your social work team about anything and ask them real specific questions about information that could be in forms that they've got that didn't get into a CPR that was about alcohol or drug taking during the pregnancy. And what, I mean, having, having got a diagnosis, I know you haven't got a, a full FASD diagnosis, but actually, where does that take you? Because it's one thing knowing what's going on but it's another thing that turning into something that makes a difference for your child. So in your case, what difference has it made so far? And if you did manage to get a full diagnosis of FASD, what difference do you think that that would make? Um, so I, I think the difference actually almost for us as parents has been recognising that some of the things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis, it's that not won't, but can't, um, and it is that head change in yourself. And in that, it kind of gives you a freedom as well to think, you know, they're not just totally ignoring me or being obstinate or all the things that your granny would want to tell you, which I know as a, an adoptive parent, you know, that you always have that whispering in your ear. But I think that actually being able to think, no, this is actually cognitively, like you can't, you just can't. Um, and actually that can help you then just overcome your complete frustration when your toilet has turned into a indoor swimming pool or whatever <laughs> he's very fascinated with water um, <laughs> um so yeah it, it, it just helps you in those moments to remain calm and just think okay you know well, this is just a different thing for today um i think as well of clearly a diagnosis will help with things like getting access to school res you know, support if we end up back in mainstream or getting a specialist school, um, but hopefully also things like DLA as well, and then as a result of that carer's allowance, which you know, for us, we're kind of thinking that that may actually help with kind of the looking after respite, that kind of thing, because it's not just um, you know, the impact on him, it's the impact on the rest of the family, and obviously we've got two other children as well, and that is impacting. I've got loads of questions in my head and it's about kind of trying to prioritise which one I ask first. So um, I want to kind of think about, you know, as adopters, because the three of us are all adopters here um, and we have our day-to-day -day issues, what are the noticeable differences in behaviour that you think, and, you know, I'm not putting you on the spot with this, but, you know, obviously I have behaviours with my son, Alison, you have <laughs> behaviours with your daughter that we relate to adoption. And how can you how can you kind of separate that out? 
I, how can you tell the difference in terms of yeah <laughs> of what it is? <laughs> so um, I think this is where it's key that actually a lot of our kids probably are affected. <laughs> so we all go, oh yeah, but mine does that as well. And almost like the parents who haven't got adopted children want to tell us all children do that. I think probably the reality is maybe a lot of our children do do these things, but that's actually because they've got this issue at the bottom um, on top of other things as well. Um, so, yeah, we see impulse control as a real issue, and that, that can be, you know, um, Daddy ended up with the smashed, you know, his head kind of split in the middle because um, a cup was thrown at bedtime with milk, um, and that literally was like a toddler behaviour of, I'm having a stretch now, I've finished my milk, and if you were sat in a high chair, you'd just drop it. Well, he sat in his bed, so he threw it across the room. Um, and it wasn't, that wasn't done in a violent way, um, it literally was, I'll finish with that now, you know. But there's no kind of thought of impulse, like, oh, there's a table next to me, I'll just put that on the table. Um, and real fascination with particular things. So there are some real crossovers with ADHD. So he's, for us, he is quite active um, from the moment he arrives, <laughs> rises to the moment he goes to sleep. I am very fortunate in that um, he does sleep and some children with FASD really struggle with sleep and I'm really fortunate that once he's actually asleep, he generally stays that way till six the next morning. It might be an early rise, but... Um, so, and, it, and it's really as well about understanding um, and I see that particularly in a middle child who, um, like the cognitive stuff, uh, an example was the other day they'd got some milk and it was in a cup and it was on the floor and I'd ask them if they could pick their milk up and put it on the sofa. And they picked the cup up and they looked on the floor and then they put the cup back down again. And I was like, could you pick the cup up? Well, I didn't say cup. I said, could you pick your milk up please and put it on the sofa? So she picked it up and she looked at it and she was like, there's still milk in it. It's not on the floor. And I was like, no. And, and her sister even had like commented before that, there's milk in the cup, you know. <laughs> so she still put the cup back on the floor. And it wasn't until I said, could you pick your cup up and put it on the sofa? And she went, oh, yeah. So it's just like this real cognitive, very, very literal. Yeah. That's, you know, something we'll find very, very literal um, and very sort of, if you, you say, you, it's hard to make a joke sometimes about dogs talking or anything like that because that's, you know, they don't do that, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, I think, yeah, for us, impulse control, but that's the thing, it's a spectrum. Yeah. Every child presents differently. Some of them have a bend towards some things more than others and vice versa. And there are a lot of crossovers with ADHD and autism as well. Um, so it's not a clear picture for people. And um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, as adoptive parents, we know about FASD. We know about all these conditions for FASD. And I just wonder, as parents, do you think there's a risk of us being, um, saying, actually, and, and self-diagnosing for our children that they have FASD? Bearing in mind that you know, you're a little bit different because you've got a detailed history of the alcohol piece, I don't have that. Do you, th do you think that's a risk? Um, I guess it is, but then maybe it's a risk about ADHD, autism, um, you know, sensory processing disorder, like any of these things. I think, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, our kids have had a really tricky start in life, and that's had a huge impact. And maybe we feel like we we need to justify that to the rest of the world sometimes and even to ourselves as well in parenting. But that doesn't mean that our children aren't struggling or suffering or been impacted by those things. Um, yeah. And um, I've got one last question for you and then Alison's probably got hundreds more. <laughs> um, in terms of your relationship with your husband, how do you think the behaviours and, you know, the 100 miles an hour kind of being active. How do you think it's affected you as an individual and as a, as a team, if you like, in terms of day-to-day -day living? So the other part of his impulse control is aggression. 
and that's definitely affected our team. <laughs> um, it affects all of us because we're all subject to that. But I think um, my husband does quite a lot of hands-on parenting. Um, so he's a carer, you know, when I'm at work. Um, and he has been subject on, I'd say, on, on a weekly basis more often than myself. Um, so I, I think that affects, that does af obviously affect his relationship with our son um, but then that impacts on everybody else as well so there's no getting away from that I, I think parenting adopted kids well generally <laughs> there's no getting away from the fact it affects your relationship <laughs> but we're a team and now we're staying that way yeah and that's that's not in question and that's why I like to use the word team really because you know you have to be don't you when you when even just embarking on any parenting, you have to be a team as well. Alison, have you got anything else that you'd like to? Yeah, because I can. I'm, I'm, I've just realised how I can edit some of this, so I can actually do it rather than send it to Al. But just in case I can, I'm just speaking into the mic, anyways, just to you know get Al's go up. So. Um, so it's a question about the future, really, um, because I think all of us as adoptive parents have a lot of 3 a.m. moments when they think, good Lord, what is going to become of this child? Um, when you think about your son's future, what, what do you worry about? What do you hope for? I'm absolutely terrified he'll end up in prison. <laughs> absolutely terrified that, yeah, the history will somewhat repeat itself. Um, when I read about his birth parents, I kind of read that and think, there was definitely stuff happening for them and that's the thing this is a genetic you know it affects uh, if my mother had drank or my grandmother had drank while my mother was in her womb uh, the egg that I was made from was being developed at that moment so therefore was affected by the alcohol that my grandmother drank um, so I think that's the thing it is a massive hidden you know and I think so many people in society could be affected as well for that, just that one reason that it's a, you know, there's a genetic history to it. Um, so yeah, I worry, are they actually ever going to leave home? <laughs> I mean, they're under 10, but <laughs> yeah, we all worry about that. Go, oh, will I ever get my life back? What was it again? <laughs> Why did I want to do this? Um, yeah, and... I do, totally. Of course I do. <laughs> and I wouldn't be without them, not at all. None of them. Um, yeah. And, uh, but he's got some absolutely great characteristics. And, you know, he's got an amazing sense of humour that's really starting to develop now. Um, and he's very, very resourceful. You know, he's, he, he does enjoy exploring the world, as lots of older people around us tell us. I think that's a nice way of saying that it can be a pain. Um, <laughs> um, and... You know, he'll always sort of, he, he just sort of goes somewhere. He's been, you know, people that are looking after him this morning and uh, today, and he, they, he was dropped off, and within minutes, apparently, he'd found the back door key. He was out in the garden, and he'd found the um, tap, to the outside tap. So he's really resourceful, yeah. <laughs> so let's just hope we can um, make that into something that gives him an income. <laughs> That's a legal one. <laughs> He'll probably end up working for the water board or something like that. Yeah, yeah hopefully, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Ali. Appreciate the time that you spent talking to us today. And, uh, okay, Alison and I are joined now by Ailsa, who's an adoptive parent. And I'm not even going to attempt your surname because I've not been able to say it all day. And I do <laughs> apologise, so I'm just going to call you Dr. Raja, if that's all right with you. Um, and we are... Um, Continuing on the discussion about the um, FASD conference in Scotland, um, and Alison's got loads of questions that she wants to ask, so I think I'm going to let her um, grab the microphone and, and make a go. Thanks, Scott. And just before I do that, just to introduce um, Dave, who's sitting <coughs> to the left of me. So. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Dave is Elsa's partner. Um, so we will come to Dave and Elsa in a second. But first of all, Dr. Raja, so you're an expert. <laughs> so give us a definition. What is this thing? What is FASD? OK, so um, I, presume, I'm, I wouldn't presume to call myself an expert, but uh, I've been doing it for about 15 years, so I'll leave that to other people. Um, the FASD is an umbrella term for people who have 
neurodevelopmental and physical difficulties which have been caused when they've been exposed to alcohol in utero. Um, that's it in a nutshell. Um, the range and extent of these difficulties are quite variable and they are often hidden so it gets missed um, and effectively there's a lot of people out there who are going around with this problem who are just unnoticed and so uh, trying to identify them is a part of what we're trying to do today hopefully. Okay, thank you. And um, so, tell us a little bit bit about the work in, in your clinic, because I, as I understand it, you've got the UK's only FASD clinic, which you started. Is that correct? Tell us a little bit, a bit about what happens there. Okay, so my clinic started as an opportunity um, out of the base of some research I was doing for my PhD. And so, in 2005, I started to research a small group of people with FASD, which was my interest at the time. An opportunity when I became a consultant when there was a change of commissioning led to us starting a very small special interest clinic which is effectively just me um, which was in 2009 and has grown to a proper multidisciplinary national clinic over that period of time which we now have multiple people in it speech and language therapy access to occupational therapy psychology um, FASD specialists who um, do a comprehensive multidisciplinary assessment. We are no longer the only UK based clinic because Scotland has one, um, which is why we're here, um, but we are the only one still I believe in England. There are places now around the country starting to develop local interests as part of wider neurodevelopmental developments, but um, we're there to try and work with them and support them so we can grow this properly. Um, you know, we don't want to do it all, we can't do it all, it's impossible to do it all, so we want to help support the development of that sort of thing. We are still the only entire country adult clinic, as I understand it, um, and so that remains, but you know, it's one of those things. We don't want to be the only people, we want to focus on doing what we can do and doing it well and letting other people do it more locally so people get access to support close to home rather than traipsing all the way around the country to see us. Um, why is it taking so long? I mean, you know, I mean, it affects so many people. Is it two out of every hundred people potentially affects across the UK? What? Why is it all taking so long? Well, the rates of two in a hundred, you say, the two percent um, could be even more. Um, and and if you're in some populations, for example, the looked after children's population or always adopted, it could be almost a third from a couple of studies that have been done. And so it's not that it's not out there; it's just not recognised. Why it's taking so long, If I don't know. I think partly it takes time from something to be first recognised, studied, for then that to get into the books and the education and those people who have been trained at an early stage to get far enough in their careers to make a difference. You know, that all takes time and I suspect we're on a journey. Um, I'm hoping by the time I retire in about 15, 20 years' time that we'll be there, but I'm not holding my breath, if you see what I mean, just in case. Okay, thanks. So um, so just just the last question really is about what, what needs to happen, so what, what change needs to happen in terms of uh, diagnosis and support for families and so on. And I know, for example, that you've given evidence to Parliament, um, so I'm sure there are some things that you'd like governments to be doing, um, so what, what, what kind of things would you like governments to be doing more of, less of, um, and, and what other things need to change? In terms of how we get a change in this, I think we need a clear strategy. I think Scotland have moved ahead of us slightly in England in that they have taken this seriously and did some work around it. I think because of the nature of England being so much bigger um, and having so much separation in terms of how it's structured, it hasn't had the same impact. There is an all-party parliamentary group chaired by Bill Esterson and he's been moving things forward and I've seen him tweeting today that he's hoping to get back on track with some of that and that will be great. I've always stayed slightly to the side of lobbying because I don't see myself as a lobbyist, I see myself as the person who's doing the clinical work and the research to try and give evidence to those people, therefore we can move it forward. So. Uh, you know, places like Adoption UK have should be the people doing the lobbying. I shouldn't be the one doing that. Um, it's about 
supporting that evidence so we have networks because once you have a diagnosis then you have to think about well what other social care support can there be how do we help education it has to be a whole system approach um, and that needs to be coordinated through both central and local government so there's a strategy now one of the things that made a huge difference for autism was the autism act but whether or not there that would ever happen for FASD is another question you know whether it can be embedded into generic approaches a local GP once said to me, you know, for every condition you tell me about, there's another 50 people knocking my door telling me about them as well. And that is the challenge, is FASD is one of many conditions that are out there, but that doesn't make it any less important. So this is something where we are on the early parts of a journey. That journey needs to progress, and hopefully, what I can say, having done this now for 15 years, is... If you look at it as a glass half full compared to a glass half empty, we've made a lot of progress. But I think I tweeted earlier that actually that doesn't mean there's not a long way to go. Um, and you can look back and say, actually, there is a positive. Conferences like this that we're doing today wouldn't have happened 15 years ago. And so we have made progress. There is interest from other people coming to us, not us having to go to them. So that is a change, and it's all positive. But, and there is a big but, we're not there yet, and I think we need to keep going. My job is to see the people, diagnose them, and do the research. There needs to be funding to help us do that, and that's missing. That is something I'm very passionate about, is that unless there is specific money to do this kind of work, and we've applied and just failed to get it because it's not been seen as important, um, we will never progress this. So that has to be something that is looked at then we can start to give the evidence base to this that will prove or disprove, because that's just as important when it is important to look for and when not look for to look for, then we can actually move it all forward and hopefully get people supported in the way they need to have it supported. Great, thanks. Well, that's a, a, a lovely moment to hand over to adoptive parents Elsa and Dave. So can you just tell us a little bit about your journey to diagnosis? Because I think you, your son was diagnosed at five, is that right? Yes. So we have had our lad since he was nine months old and very quickly we realised that there were things that were out with the norm for even for a small person um, and our first battles were with people like the health visitor who was a lovely woman um, but said this is all normal developmental stuff and I was saying he's banging his head off the radiator so hard that it, it can't be good for him and he's, no, he's feeling no pain at all. Um, the sleep disruption, all the all the usual things that happen. That was that was down to attachment because he just moved and he never he, he just didn't sleep. Um, and it took a long time for us to actually find our feet as parents and realise that we should have more confidence in, in what we were seeing. Um, and not listen to the people who were saying it's a developmental stage, it's attachment. Have you considered he might be autistic? Um, all children do that. All the, all the usual things that Rajal have heard a million times in his clinic. Um, and then I did a lot of reading, and, and so did Dave, around FASD. And there was this horrible kind of... We, I don't want to think about this because it's a lifelong disability and, and we don't know how we're going to cope with this and we don't know how we're going to support him to cope with it. And then there was the coming back round to he needs a diagnosis. And our paediatrician, who's a lovely woman, said, um, there's no point in diagnosing him. She said, I could di diagnose him now, I could tell you he had FESD now, but there's no point in labelling him because there's no support. Um, but at that time, he was already at risk of being excluded from his preschool nursery because the staff there were seeing his bad behaviour. And we're both teachers. Um, we're both good managers of behaviour and we'd known by this point that the traditional method of parenting was not working with our child. In fact, it made him worse. Um, but he was also coming home saying, I'm bad and I make everyone sad. And he was four. <laughs> and, and I thought, this, we, we both thought this can't, this can't continue. It can't continue. And so we basically headbutted our way through services to get a diagnosis, which involved our paediatrician, who is going to set up the Edinburgh Clinic, I think she's been working with Raja, and um, the um, educational psychologist doing the different tests. And finally, in November, it came back, yes, your, your child has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, by that time, I had 
educated the nursery and got the additional support for learning teacher involved. So his behaviour at nursery was actually improving and the staff were starting to see it as brain damage and not him being feral. Um, so it's, it's been a long road and we're at the start of our journey. We're now trying to drip feed into him. His brain works differently and sometimes things are, are more difficult for him than for other people. Um, but it's... Um, See, seeing Lee, your, your adult speaker with FASD, was quite a moment for us because it's, it's that window into the future of, of what our little lad might be like. Dave, what, uh, what about you? What was it like watching Lee for you? It was actually um, really, really interesting because one of the things um, that we love so much about our little boy is his sense of humour, <laughs> his positivity, his willingness uh, to engage in difficult situations. and. You know the fact that there will be difficult, uh, difficult situations for all of us ahead. But his ability to shine through in these situations, I really saw in in Lee as well. So obviously, it, it, it's a very difficult thing. I think myself and my wife have, have thought a lot of the time about almost sort of like lowering our sights in in terms of expectations. But we're thinking very much now in sort of like moving the sights sideways. You know, and we've realised, you know, essentially. If we live our lives thinking, well, we got onto a plane and we got off the plane expecting to be in Amsterdam and we're in Hong Kong, well, there's no point in walking about Hong Kong feeling miserable for all the rest of your life. It's a different place. And uh, with our diagnosis now, we're, we're really just moving forward to get him the support that he needs and looking forward to, to going on the journey with him because, you know, as much as there is frustrations, as much as there will be difficulties going ahead, you know, life is is hysterical with him a lot of the time and uh, it was really really nice uh, to see Lee there uh, who's faced his difficulties and you know risen through them um, really you know obviously on, on, on his own merit and through his own strength of character with with support so it was it's really 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 encouraged me today and you know I, I feel 10 foot taller coming out of this place today so it's been really good <laughs> That's wonderful. That's so so lovely to hear. Um, so, Roger, uh, does this do, is this all sound familiar? The battles, the headbutting, the, the 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 need for this this adoptive family to be advocates on their child's behalf in order to get what they need. Yeah, I think uh, I've heard it many times, as you can probably guess. Um, we did a piece of research which was published in uh, Journal of Adoption and Fostering back in 2013, which showed a lot of this. So this isn't new. Um, I want to reframe it a little bit because we always talk about negatives. Hong Kong can be very nice, by the way. Um, um, but, um, um, and so, but it's a nice way of putting it because actually you're not where you thought you were going to be. But what you've described lovely is that these kids have a lot of positives about them. Whilst they may have some disabilities, they have a lot of abilities. And it's that half cup approach to it. And the narrative around FASD is very negative at the moment. And I don't think it has to be. If you understand the kids and you can support their disabilities and work and improve their abilities, they can thrive. You know, they may never become a rocket scientist, but not everybody has to be. You know, they can have fully fulfilled lives which are positive and engaged and they actually can provide a lot of positivity for their families as well, which is what you've both described, if you understand it and can support that. If they don't get the negative self-esteem issues through us always saying, you're doing really badly, you know, and say, actually, you've done that really well, well done, you know, reframe it, put it in a positive terms. You know, that's all really good because then what you've got is somebody who is feeling positive about themselves, who doesn't get the secondary second disabilities, who the network around them understands them, so doesn't put the pressure on them. And so we all reframe it and say, actually, yes, there is a disability here, but considering we have a disabled kid, actually, it ain't that bad. You know? And I think if we can be honest and have that conversation, that's a really good place to be. Um, but there is so much negativity around it right now because everybody's scared that of all the different potential negative outcomes that people forget there's a lot of positives. Um, and that is not to lose sight of the difficulties that go with it, but it is to think... You know, what do we do differently? How can we understand it? But that does need that whole system approach to make sure that we can diagnose it early. And you're, you've, you've diagnosed it easily early enough. You know, the outcomes will be better because you have diagnosed it early. Um, you know, 
you know, the problem is sometimes it doesn't present that early, and so that's a challenge to keep an eye on it. But the fact that you've got it, the diagnosis, you can now start doing the work, getting them to understand their own needs, and sort of to show, yes, I am different, but you know what? I can still do this, and I'm good at this. And you know, and you emphasize that. You know, my, my two kids are very different. Neither of them are particularly sporty, but they're good at other things. You know, we emphasize the positivities. Kids are kids. Not everybody's going to be a Premier League football player. You know, that's the nature of it. You know, they might like football, but they may not be that great. You know, it's a reframing. It's saying, actually, you can enjoy things. You can be good at one thing and be terrible at something else. That's life. But in, reframe it. Enjoy the positives. And I think that's really nicely how you put it. Yeah, does that sound good? That sounds yeah, about right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's what we try to do. It's what we try to do with our wee lad um, all the time. We, he knows what being resilient is. He can demonstrate when he's resilient. Um, and he can. Um, he, he gets tremendous satisfaction from, from doing things. And also, there's, there's fantastic upsides to FASD and his, his visual learning, his observation of things that we would miss. Um, uh, he's got he's got huge talents, actually, um, be, just because his brain is wired a wee bit differently, works a wee bit differently, um, and as Dave said, he's he's a born comedian. He's very funny. <laughs> Certainly brightens our lives. Thanks for that. I really, I find it really interesting. And you're the third um, doctor parents who've talked to today who have involvement in FASD and I say that because some don't have diagnosis. What are your hopes for your son in the future? What what is your not necessarily your your you know dream goal but what what do you hope he achieves in the future? For me it would be good self esteem, kindness and happiness. Uh, for me um, I just hope he's productive. Um, essentially you know when, when we talk about revising down expectations, well, we move our expectations sideways. He can be whatever he wants to be, as long as he's kind, enthusiastic, gracious, just a nice chap. <laughs> so, you know, and it contributes something in the world, whatever that is, just brightens people's lives, you know, because there are lots of people who, you know, are in incredibly clever, but they never make people smile. So essentially, if he, if he goes through his life and he's, you know, a thoroughly decent chap, that will be... That would be good enough for me. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So I'm now joined by Lee Harvey Heath, who, who is probably what I would describe as the, the main event of today's FASD conference in Edinburgh. Um, he received a standing ovation, actually, for um, his, um, his presentation and his talk. Welcome, Lee. Good evening, Scott. Ah, uh, yeah. And um, I've... I, I, I won't ask too much now, but um, you are basically, you were diagnosed with FASD as an adult. Yes, at the age of 26. The age of 26. So yeah. How old are you now? I'm 32 now. I had to think about that. <laughs> yeah. Old man now. Um, Getting there. So what was, what was life without knowing um, that you had FASD like growing up? What was it like? It was hard. It is... It's growing up, um, as I said in my in my talk, you know, you you, you know you're different, but you don't know why. Um, you look at everyone, and you see that everyone is different, and you see that everyone is normal, and you know something isn't right, but you can't put your finger on it, you can't explain it, and as sometimes you know you you feel too uncomfortable to want to go and talk to someone. And say, you know, why do I feel different? Why can't I have friendships like other people can have friendships? Mm. So, um, and growing up like that, it's, it's lonely. Yeah. Um, going through school, not being able to express what's going on in your head because you know people are going to look at you funny. You know people aren't going to understand it. So, um, you know, it's not something I'd wish on anyone else. And it's worthwhile mentioning you obviously were adopted as a child as well, weren't you? Yes, so yeah. Did you sometimes wonder if it was more connected to your adoption than, than anything else? Or, or was that not really a factor I, for you? I wouldn't say the adoption, no. I would say more, you know, 
before the adoption, the things that happened before the adoption. Yeah. You know, the trauma I'd already been through. Yeah. You know, that, that set me apart from everyone else. Mm-hmm. Um because people looked at me differently when they knew I was adopted. They looked at me differently. Yeah. Um, you know, times are different now. Yeah. yeah. It's not so looked upon as, you know, well, you, you're not with your birth parents. Why? Um, but, yeah. And what sort of um, kind of... Because when I'm, I'm speaking to adopters with children who either they suspect have got FASD or they're in the process of getting a diagnosis or they have been diagnosed with FASD, one of the main things is about behaviours um, and how it's very difficult to support children who have behaviours that actually, you know, they're not equipped to deal with. So what sort of behaviours did you expert when you were kind of growing up that were different? If you can remember them, I'm sure you can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I remember the bad ones. <laughs> uh, well, it's going through school, you know, it's the, the teachers and even even my mum were talking to me like I was normal. And, you know, I was never normal. Mm. What they expected me to understand and listen to, you know, I, I simply wasn't capable of doing. Mm. And when you've got mainstream teachers teaching mainstream students and you've got the odd the one odd child you have to be you have to be able to teach that child differently Mm -hmm. because you know it's not we can't change the damage is already done the damage is never going to get any better so they can't expect young children to change to fit their classroom yeah it has to be the other way around yeah and if professionals don't realize this then it's never going to change this, these individuals these children are always going to struggle they shouldn't have to try and keep up with everyone else because it's not going to happen yeah. put them in a situation where the teaching is set right for them and they'll thrive they'll become they'll become amazing they'll find their strong points and um and they'll grow from that but stick them in a place where they're struggling and they're drowning under all this work that, you know, these kids are doing these days, they're never going to go anywhere. And that that affects lifelong. Mm. That affects after school as well when they've got no GCSEs and they can't get a job. And they've already, they've already got to the point where, well, what's the point? I give up. Nobody's listening to me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it has a huge knock-on effect later on in life. Yeah. And do you feel that actually school was a big part of what then, you know, so did you did you feel that that kind of contributed to your behaviour at home and, you know, with yeah. your friends and stuff like that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have friends. No. You know, I, I struggled, I had the, the, the few friends that were all in the special needs group, but, you know, I felt different to them. They had a better bond between them. You know, they, they'd go out in the evenings after school and hang out together. You know, I wasn't involved. Right. Um, I, again, you know, I didn't know why. I didn't know what was wrong. Um, and yeah, I, I, I hated school. Every morning my mum had a nightmare because I didn't want to go, because I didn't fit in and I struggled and I felt like the teachers would pick on me um, because they they just thought I was lazy yeah. and couldn't be bothered. And, you know, that's, that's all I ever heard. Every school report said, you know, I couldn't concentrate. Um, I didn't want to do the work. Yeah. If only that was the truth, eh? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> We'd have answered a lot of questions for you. I know, yeah. <laughs> so so you, you did school and then obviously you got to a point in your life where you, know, you had ups and downs as a, as a late teen, early adult, honestly. Yeah. Well, I yeah, know this, um, but I'm trying to yeah, <laughs> give yeah. you the option. Uh, at, the, at, the age of, at the age of 10, um, as you know, my dad died, my biological father, um, and that had a massive effect. You know, that, that sunk me into depression. Um, you know, at that age, I was having mental breakdowns. Um, you know, the trauma I'd been through as a child, the adoption, all of it, you know, I think by then it had all added up. And then up until the age of 10, you know, I'd always envisioned that I'd see my parents again. Um, and then to be told two weeks after his funeral that he'd passed away, you know, that, that broke me. 
I, I still remember the day I found out. You know, it was coming. It was a normal day. It was a normal school day. I was coming home from school. My mum was stood in the middle of the road crying. I, I can picture it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Um, but you know that once I'd left school, um, that was such a life changing moment for me. And the only way I could forget about it was to drink. Um, and then you know within six months the addiction had already got hold which and was then, probably in you anyway wasn't it yeah. yes yeah. yeah but at that time it was my friend yeah yeah you know it felt like my friend it was my only escape um and you know this, the the suicide attempts had started happening um i'd left home at the age of 15 so you know i, I could do what i want i knew best <laughs> i really didn't <laughs> But I had independence, nobody to tell me what I had to do. Um, so, you know, I was drinking four or five times a week. And then obviously, what, what, what kind of, what led you to a place where you thought, actually, do you know what, there's something just not right. You know, there's, it, there's something more than just, you know, the school thing and, What's, you know, what, what led to that? What led to that? Event? So over from the age of 15, 16, um, over a 10 year span of drink, drugs, suicide attempts, self-harm, being arrested, broken relationships and losing, you know, contact with my own children. Um, it was a four-year prison sentence that I got for a robbery. Yeah. Hanging around with the wrong people, easily influenced. Um, and I came out of prison, and, you know, it's first day of freedom. First thing I wanted to do was have a drink. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't very long before I, you know, got back to the point where I was two years before. Um, I'd just spent two years sober, um, you know, in my head at that time, I was going to come out. I was going to change my life. I was going to, everything was going to be peachy. It was all going to go well. And well, a week after being released, that had just gone. You know, I was back drinking again. Um, and it, it got to the point where, you know, I was missing my kids. I was missing, I had two children by then that I wasn't seeing because of my addiction. I was putting drink first. Um, and one of my sisters has, has got to the point where she was giving up on me. Um, you know, my other sister, she was like, well, if you're not dead, then you're going to be back in prison again. And I think all of it kind of was a bit of a wake-up call. And I got to the point where I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to be like that anymore. Something was wrong. I didn't know. I didn't know what. But I just knew I didn't want to live like that anymore. Yeah. So um, one day I I rang my mum, my adopted mum, and said, "Look, I've had enough. I need help. Um, can I come and stay with you?" And um, she she thankfully said yes. So I moved from where I was living to a completely different city. And she got me sober. And it was then, without the, dr the drink clouding who I was and what was going on, it was then my mum could realise that the problems that I had as a child, I still had as an adult. Same ones, the memory problems, the lack of concentration, so she thought, the, the laziness. Mm. Um, and she, she'd heard about fetal alcohol. Okay. And uh, she, it, her words were, I went to the library, I, I googled fetal alcohol, and I read a profile that was you. Right. And she says that that, that made her cry because she just read me everything. So, um, you know, we went down the road to get a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when things started to change. So just out of interest, how did you manage to get the, down the diagnosis route? Was that a referral from a GP mm -hmm. or? It was my mum screaming at the GP. 
Isn't it funny? Um, Most adopted yeah. parents actually have to scream at somebody at some point yeah. uh, every day. So yeah. <laughs> But it was also the fact that my mum didn't know if someone my age had been diagnosed before. Yeah, of course. Because she saw a lot of these websites was all children. Mm-hmm. So she wasn't sure if someone my age had been diagnosed. So she chose to um, go to Dr. Mukherjee, yeah. who she found out was the leading clinical specialist in fetal alcohol. Yeah. And um, she paid for the diagnosis. And we went to his clinic in Surrey. And he diagnosed me with alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. Fab. I mean that in a, in a not. In a, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Fab. But, you know, fab. You got. To, you got. To, yeah. You knew what it was. You got a diagnosis. Yes, there was. There was an answer. There was a light yeah. at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It must have been like a. I want to compare it to a light bulb moment for you, really, in some ways. It must have been like wow. It like, was like that, a weight had been lifted. Yeah. Yeah. And you knew it wasn't you. It was, yeah. yeah. That was the it's biggest not, thing. Yeah. That was the biggest thing for me. I realised that it's not me. Yeah. So, wow. and, and my mum started to realise it as well. My mum would actually start listening to me when I said, I don't know. Because um, that was quite often the answer she'd get from me. <laughs> I have interest. How many times have you used that just because, you know, you couldn't be bothered in your life? Well, you used that a couple of times? <laughs> Possibly a couple of times. It usually comes when it comes to making decisions, though. Yeah. I don't but then do could decisions. Could that not be a part of the disorder as well? You know, as the fact yes. that you yeah. could, the, could the fact that, yeah. yeah, or the fact that I've got two options. I don't know which to choose. Yeah, of course. So I say, I don't know, and let someone else choose for me. Yeah. It's yeah, easier that, that way. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sorry, don't get me wrong, I'm not mocking you on that. I just find that, you know, quite interesting that. Um, something that would come naturally to people anyway, you know. Uh, yeah. Good. You know, I, I do it sometimes, you think, well, I don't know. Because yeah. you literally yeah. don't know because you've got a choice and you don't know. Yeah. Choice, you know. As, you as a child, know. you know, a lot of these children do say, I don't know. And, you know, I did. And that's because that's the truth. Yeah. You know, why did you do that? Well, I don't know. Because my brain's not telling me why I did that. Yeah. So yeah. the only answer is, I don't know. Yeah. And there's there's a lot of understanding to be had with FASD. Yeah. If you don't understand it, you're never going to get around it or help someone that's got it. Yeah. Understanding is key yeah. for fetal alcohol. Yeah. And supporting anyone that has it. So, yeah. but yeah, I think my mum got sick of me saying I don't know after, you know, five years let alone like 30. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously you get a diagnosis and, and, and you kind of come to terms with that. What, what, what changed for you, you know, whether it was immediate you noticed or whether it was over time, what, what were the biggest changes in you that you noticed? Was it just an acceptance thing or was it, you know, just, wow, I know what it is? It's, it was, first of all, it was like an answer to a million questions and there was just the one answer for it and that was it yeah. um, and the relationship between my mum changed drastically really she began to listen to me and try and understand me yeah. and it was that point I felt you know hang on a minute I can maybe talk about it now and you know tell her what's going on in my head rather than bottling it up because I know I sound stupid um, and you know it's this little little things you know I said in the conference I think about the sugar bowl little things like that shaking the sugar bowl because the sugar needs to be level yeah 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 and she, she said to me one day why did you do that and I told her because the sugar needs to be level she's like you know that's not right right and we <laughs> laughed we just stood there and laughed about it yeah but beforehand, you know, there was never any laughing about anything that I'd done. Yeah. It was always something bad, usually. Yeah. Um, like, not being able to go up and get something from one bedroom. Because by the time I've got to the top of the stairs, I've forgotten what room she said it was in. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And it was always the same. That, that, just that one thing was over and over again for years. Yeah. And, you know, for her, it was frustrating. Yeah. You know, why don't you listen to me? Why can't you listen to me? 
It's simple instructions. Yeah, it is for a neurotypical person. Yeah. But not for someone that's got poor memory recall and that's going to lose it within five seconds if you give me three instructions. And I think probably the likelihood is the people that are listening to this podcast will recognise that whether they've got a child with a diagnosis or whether they're, you know, they yeah. suspect FASD because yeah. you know, that's, I do hear that quite a lot actually. Yeah. About that sort of thing. So, so you got your diagnosis and, and, you know, this kind of change happened to you. How, how I mean, I know how you've been using uh, your diagnosis to, to kind of get on in life, but yeah. Tell us a bit about what you've done since your diagnosis. <laughs> what haven't I done? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, once I got to grips with my diagnosis and how my ARND affected me, you know, I'm not going to say I've got everything under my hood and I don't know everything about my FASD. I still struggle now sometimes. But, you know, the biggest things are the ones that I figured, okay, that's why I'm doing it. Or, you know, okay, I'm doing that, but it's not my fault. So, you know, and I started to join online support groups, um, FASD UK. Um, and there was so many questions on there from parents regarding children that these parents are pulling their hair out. And, you know, these, these kids, well, they don't know what's going on. And I found myself answering questions that the parents were putting. I was like the voice of this kid, and I didn't even know this kid. But it was helping the parent understand what the child's going through. And that's the kind of the moment I realized, you know, hang on. I have a, I have a head full of knowledge. Yeah, it's only on my diagnosis, and I don't know everything about every diagnosis. Um, but, you know, what I do know... I can share with other people and help them understand their children or teens. Yeah. And that's where I found, you know, not only was it useful to them, but it was rewarding for me. It made it actually something that made me feel good about myself. Yeah. You know, I've just been for a hell of a life, but actually that hell that I've just been through is helpful to other people. So I started to share my story. I started to be open about it. You know, for, for quite a time I was ashamed, you know. I'm not I'm not the crime type. I'm not the, the prison person that I was labelled for. But it happened, you know. I did it. So I did I did the time as part of my story. But, you know, I was I just realized, you know, I need to help other people. I need these people to, you know, know what these children are going through. So, you know, these children don't go through what I went through. A life without a diagnosis, a life of crime, a life of suicide attempts, drinking, drugs. It's not a life for anyone. But why should they go through it when it's not necessarily their fault? It's nobody's fault, but... If they don't have a diagnosis, then nobody's going to pick up on it and they're just going to be blamed. And, you know, it it doesn't end well. Let's just leave it at that. It doesn't end well without a diagnosis and without support. So what is the future for Lee Harvey Heath then? The future for Lee Harvey Heath? Well, now... He's getting a bit of a name for himself, is a little bit of a... Apparently so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so now, you know, I'm... I'm focusing more on my own region, Devon and Cornwall. You know, a couple of years ago, I needed support. I went looking. There was none. So rather than do all this online stuff I was doing, you know, I thought, well, what about the people that are in my own city? What about the people that are in my own region? So I took it upon myself to start a support group. And I'm now looking at starting a um, non-profit organization. FASD Devon and Cornwall with me at the forefront of FASD in the southwest yeah yeah and Working of course you've, with... you, you've 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 spoken at a few conferences and things like that yeah. yes not, yeah. this wasn't unfortunate it will definitely not be the last no, my, my first was with you I know well, yeah oh thanks <laughs> gee oh shucks <laughs> you. 
it was, and I'll tell you what, it was it was a risk for you, because um, yeah. I remember that day actually. Um, we yeah. did that thing in Essex, didn't we? And, yeah. And, and I went over my time for God knows how. You long. did, but we didn't care because it, it wouldn't have mattered to be fair. Because you know, it was just—I mean, like tonight, I could, I'm, you know, today I, I could obviously sit and um, just listen to you for ages because it is such a fascinating story, and that's also really informative. But I do remember that day, and I remember how nervous you were. That was um, scary. Yeah, you were, and 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 then seeing you today, turn up with full of confidence. The 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 difference is just immense. So. Yeah. You know what? It's it's a real. You know, you should be really proud of yourself, actually, for what you've achieved. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm proud to say I, I obviously found you first, but you know we won't kind of <laughs> come back too much. No, come but, on, um, watch your ego. I'll, yeah, I'll take that little bit. Back yeah. Um. So um. So um. FAS Devon and Cornwall. F- did you say? FASD Devon and Cornwall. Yeah. And you're on Twitter as that as well. We're on Twitter, yeah. Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. So all of this. So everybody can come and find you and then they can ask yes. lots of questions and they can come and listen to you when you advertise for your next speaking and all that yep. sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Lee, thank you very much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. You've this is the second time that I've spoken to you and you've kind of moved me to, to nearly tears again. So thanks oh, sorry. you've obviously you obviously <laughs> hit something in me that I don't know what it is. But um I've I've enjoyed um seeing you again and um Hopefully we will um, catch up again very soon. Yes, for your next conference. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Lee. No worries. Take care. So there you have it. A really interesting, very long day here in Edinburgh. Um, It's been, it's just, it's just been an eye opener for the parents that have left. um, When uh, they've caught me on the way out, they've said how life-changing some of this stuff is that we found out today so it's been a you know it's really been a good day um all of the information is going to be available on the adoption uk website um we do need to thank them because actually they've given us access to this uh, to all the the speakers and i guess that we've spoken to today so thank you very much adoption uk and to alison my um very temporary co-host um because i'm sure i was going to kick my butt when i get back to Englandshire um, next week. So you can check out the website adoptionuk.org um, and there is um, the, you'll be able to search from it there. Uh, thank you for listening and um, Al and I will be back soon in our um, normal flow.